everybody. David tells me I'm a little pixely today, so I apologize in advance if we got bandwidth issues. We're having a snowstorm here in upstate New York. I was out shoveling earlier, so if uh, my mind drifts, it's uh, probably just fatigue. I think they call it fatigue. Uh, it's good to see everybody here. Um, today, as 5 Watt Live is brought to you with the support of you, friends of 5 Watt. Uh, and on Patreon, and I'll talk about that later in the stream. I've known David, I'd known, I had known David Barber for about a year when we hatched this idea for making the video uh, about the history of the 1966 John Mayall and the Blues Breakers featuring Eric Clapton uh, album. We made that history. That, that actually, that video's done pretty well. It was a ton of work. And honest, to be perfectly honest, if it wasn't for David and Jeff having, Jeff Macrolane, having studied that music for the good better part of their lives, I probably wouldn't have done the record. I mean, the uh, video about that record. Um, it, it was really daunting. And David found amazing stuff about what the single chain was at DECA that was available uh, on the recording date, et cetera. And I, I thought that video turned out great. And it was mostly due to them, uh, the two of those guys. Um, as I said, they've both been studying it for a long time. So when David and I started talking about the tweaks we wanted to do to the five watt version of the burn unit super sport, which was a pedal that he had built before, but I wanted it to be different. We had already used his uh, version four direct drive pedal. And I'm, I got an image of it. I'll put it up later when we talk about it, when we talk about amp emulation pedals, probably when David talks about amp emulation pedals. Um, but he had achieved this amazing blues breaker kind of tone on that V4 version of that pedal. And so we just wanted to tweak that even to make it more because those are one of my two, my two sort of holy grail tones for guitar are uh, an overdrive special and um, a blues breaker and, you know, JTM 45. That's sort of the core of all great rock tone as far as I'm concerned. Um, so David had figured out a way to do that in the direct drive. And so we brought that over into the Burn Unit, Unit Super Sport. The Super Sport part of the Burn Unit Super Sport name was actually a hot rodded Marshall. Um, and so we just kind of dialed, well, I'll let him explain how he actually did it. He didn't just dial it back. He's a genius. Um, not to make him uncomfortable, I can see him in the green room there. Uh, anyway, so we've been answering questions about the bus as it occurred. Um, and I thought of dedicating a live stream conversation to outlining the difference between the Blues Breaker amp and the Blues Breaker pedal would be important. So that's what we're gonna do today, all right? Uh, Bebe is here moderating for us today. Uh, I'm always, it's always great to have him here to correct me if I misspeak, you know, not that I say something wrong, <laughs> but um, if I did, then I've got Bebe to back me up. Uh, I had Jeff, I can put this up. There we go. Uh, that's an image from when Jeff recorded that clip that you heard on the intro is Jeff doing uh, ch channeling his inner Eric Clapton from the recordings he made for the Beano album video be and then later for the Beano on the budget. I think that actually was for the Beano on a budget. Uh, and in that clip, he's playing his historic makeover R9 Les Paul into a Barber direct drive into a 1964 Fender Princeton reverb amplifier that belongs to his brother, I think. Let me see if I can leave that up at the same time. Put that up. Uh, switch those two around. There, there we go. There's Jeff. Um, and you even got, I, I had a member of Five Watt World when I said on a live stream that I was working on this video and he actually sent me three copies of the current Beano car, uh, comic book magazine. It's, there's one right in the background. I sent one to David and I sent one to Jeff after the, after the thing so we could all do pictures like the originals. Uh, Jeff actually told me that this was one of his favorite tones that came from the whole project. And he owns a 1971 Marshall Super Lead, 100 Watt Super Lead. Um, but one of his favorite tones was actually the amp emulation pedal into a Fender style amp. All right. So uh, I'm editing the guitars of Paul McCartney video, and I hope to have that ready for the weekend. Uh, check the description for links um, for the store for t-shirts, hoodies, and hats and mugs. And also there's a link there for the Barber 5 Watt World uh, bus pedal uh, on Reverb. If you're international, reach out to David directly via his email on, uh, and he'll he'll be able to get it to you quicker and uh, probably much less expensive. Lee, uh, remember if you have a question or a comment, go ahead and put it in the chat with a question mark and a space. Um, it's different than if I'm doing it over in... Um, 
YouTube. I'm using StreamYard and it's easier for me to see it in the chat. And I will take breaks to go and answer questions as we go along. Uh, so with that preamble, uh, I see Bebe helping out already. <laughs> uh, David Cromwell says, Jeff will arrive in five minutes or longer. He has a friend in town. His buddy Hermano is in town from, um, uh, where is Hermano from? He's in Italy, but I can't remember off the top of it. Um, let's see. And okay, let me bring David on and we'll start. We're going to do a bunch of definitions, terms, terms first. Oh, let's get Jeff off. There we go. Hey, David. Hey, Keith, how you doing? <laughs> good. Hey, everybody. Yeah, prove, prove to me we have audio. That's right. <laughs> That's very good. I'm here. Um, okay, so Jeff, Jeff is our expert witness today. Uh, no pressure. Um, so let's do some definition of terms. And it's funny, I actually was write up the notes for this. And to a great extent, there's a, a all of the talking points of this kind of springboard out of what do people mean when they say blues breaker? Um, and so uh, it's, it's a big, big section on definition of terms. Um, uh, Josh uh, Scott did a great video on this um, and David and I were talking about it. It's a similar outline because it really is basically doing the chronology of the Bluesbreaker amp, kind of the naming of it and where that comes from and the tone, and then also then the release of the pedal and then subsequent pedals and the difference between a Bluesbreaker pedal that's working off of the circuit of the uh, 1992 Marshall released black box Bluesbreaker pedal and pedals that are trying to emulate the sound of the amplifier itself. And there I'm right at the edge of my knowledge base. So let's do, uh, let's talk about, um, the blues breaker album um david and i had a uh, shared a moment where he had a house guest who didn't know who johnny carson was the other day which we yeah. enjoyed in the sort of category of how old can you feel uh so um so it's important i think to mention a record from 1966. so in 1966 um uh, uh, july 22nd 1966 um john mayall and the Blues Breakers featuring Eric Clapton with Eric Clapton was released. Uh, ironically, actually, Clapton had left the band by that point as he had, I think he quit the band three different times. Um, and um, on that session, he, Clapton plugged into, he plugged his 1960 Les Paul into a two by 12 Marshall combo. And it was, then he proceeded to crank it up and he wanted to capture, they wanted to capture the sound of the band live that they were, because they were really kind of, uh, cooking in clubs all over uh, London and really all around Southern England. Um, so it's loud as heck and it's bleeding into other microphones and the white coated engineers, because at the time that, you know, people that were engineers in those recording studios were real engineers. It wasn't a casual term. It was a, a specific description of guys who had gone to school for that. Um, and they hated it. <laughs> they, they, by all accounts, they, uh, they argued with them and stuff. And you wonder how much of this is mythology. Um, they still course, believe there was rules. They what? They still believe they, there was rules. That's a good point. Exactly. They still <laughs> believed there was rules, right? And uh, and Clapton was More like, rules. "Yeah, there's, there's no rules. What rules?" So, so uh, as I said, um, somewhat ironically, by the time the album came out and was a big hit, and is credited with launching the um, British blues explosion, um, he was already on to cream. And, and he, he'd already, his Les Paul had already been stolen um, from a, a rehearsal session with Cream, et cetera. So um, by the time that tone came out, he, he was actually playing into full Marshall stacks. He had moved away from using the combo. And the, and the mythology around the combo, which Josh, which Josh reports in his video, and I've read a number of times, but I've also, if you look at the timeline of it, it feels a little, feels a little shaky. Um, when Clapton came back and made that record, he had actually been on a, on a vacation-y trip with a band to Greece for the summer. And he got back into town and the way I'd read about it in a couple of different places was he went over to Jim Marshall and he's like, what do you have, you know, that will work for me and, uh, and what can I afford? And Jim basically let him have this combo uh, or they hadn't done it and they squeezed it into a combo. There's actually been a debate about what the specific circuit was, whether it was a tremolo circuit that was modified, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, Yes. 
I, you know, that part I wasn't, I, the, the tremolo bit I hadn't caught, but I, I know both schematics. So yeah. Okay. You know, both schematics. So talk a I little mean, bit you know about what the, so what, talk about what a blues breaker amp is. This is a picture of a reissue. I, so, you know, most people, uh, I don't think would argue too much. It was Jim Marshall and the people who worked with them, their interpretation of a 59 basement, what we think was a 59 basement, a tweed basement. Uh, which was an amp that um, was very difficult for them to get and to bring in at a reasonable price in England. So they decided to make their own version. Uh, I guess uh, Ken Brand was involved in that. Yeah. And I think there's another fellow too. Uh, but it's kind of the classic, you know, four input, two channel, so, you know, two different uh, paths that have their own volume knob. Um, and then bass, middle, treble presence type of amp. So this is, you know, Marshall's basements, you know, so we all kind of know that basic format. Uh, but it differs from the uh, Fender basement in that it uses KT-66 power tubes. Um, and uh, it's a 212 in the case of Clapton, not a 410. And then the transformers that are used are uh, British transformers, uh, the radio spares, I believe. And so they're different than what uh, was being used by Fender at the time. I, I think uh, Marshall still considers it a 30 watt amp. I, I, I don't know uh, whether uh, when you get into two 6L6s and a certain amount of voltage on them, it seems like people will call it anything from 30 to 50, just almost on a whim. So. Uh, and KT66s are, have a similar output. I saw that Lyle uh, dropped in from Cyanic Audio. KT66s have a similar output given the same amount of voltage as a 6L6? Maybe considered a little bit softer vacuum, so maybe not quite as uh, you know robust there. But uh, it's a, I think they're both power beam forming pentodes, just like a okay. 6L6 is. Okay. 5881, I believe, too. 5881? 6L6 is. Is there... Uh, do people talk about there being a different tone, a different sound to KT-66? I think a 6L6 is a little harder sounding than a KT-66 is. And a KT-66 is a little rounder sounding than the EL-34 that most people think of when they think of like a Plexi Marshall mm -hmm. kind of sound. So that's got a little bit more of that crack to it, uh, a little bit more barbed wire to it on the, on the uh, EL-34. Mm -hmm. Whereas um, the KT-66 is definitely a softer, rounder kind of presentation. And my memory of this was that 6L6s were difficult to get in um, in England at the time. And then when the when the EL34s became more available, they moved to the EL34s for the JT35s. Well, I, I think just initially the KT66 was probably the closest thing that they had. So they were just using, you know, if you look at the early schematics, it usually says ECC83 uh, for the preamp tubes, not 12AX7 or, or a selected version, which is a 7025. So... Isn't an uh, ECC 83 just a naming convention different British? It is. That's what I'm saying. That's, that's what these tubes were called in, in England. And so instead of a 5A or 4, it's a GZ34. It's KT66, which is a different tube than a uh, 6L6. But it's, it's close enough for what they're doing, I believe. Uh, I don't remember the exact impedance of a KT66 in comparison to a 6L6, but it's close. <laughs> so this is a four input amp. This is the classic jumper, the two channels, use the two volumes to blend a brighter and a less bright channel. Yes. Yeah. It basically it works very similar to, to what a, uh, like a plexi would or any of the four input amps that, that you, you know, would think of. And this is an open back two by 12 combo. And as I said, the myth is that, you know, he, he asked for something that would fit into the trunk of his car that was also loud enough to gig with. Yeah. 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 It's, 212. Right. I, I don't know whether that myth is 100% true or not, because Clapton can't recollect. <laughs> he didn't know what he would ever need to. And even if he did, he washed away some of those brain cells probably early on. Yeah, I'm and, sure. And then again, and then again, and then again. Um, but um, yeah, I don't, and I, I don't think that's the kind of thing he spends a lot of time thinking about, like recounting the, the gear for his tone. He always seems to just be moving along and using what he likes, but not necessarily worried about... Uh, what we're all worried about making notes in a booklet about what years he used those. Yeah. He's not trying to get back to where he was. <laughs> ah, exactly. That's great. Um, so that's the blues breaker amp. That's it's a Marshall combo, uh, as I said. Um, and then, um, 
And then you really don't see it being used. It's not like it was a thing. It, there, people moved to four by twelves, heads, et cetera. Clapton being right at the front of the line doing that, and then all the other guys that came after were also using four by twelves, um, pretty much. Yeah, it seemed like the head format and a couple of cabinets got popular pretty quickly. I don't know between sixty five and like 67 68 and things like that what was going on i would imagine the combos were getting used uh, a bit but it's just we know what we saw because popular guitar players used them right and so if there wasn't somebody popular using them i don't know how many of those combos uh are are out there yeah i don't original. know the numbers yeah right. yeah I, I, you don't see them very often i mean i've, re, I've repaired uh many you know plexi amps and i've played through and seen and sold and purchased many you know plexi style amps but jtm 45s were not common to roll across and a combo um i don't know if i've ever been in the room with a real one now that i think about it huh yeah i'm which, not sure if which, i've ever which, uh, repaired one of those a, a real one from back in the day yeah yeah a, a real, and you a see real boxes one. you see uh, you know a, a lot of early el34 marshals but not kt66 uh, huh interesting so then um if we fast way forward um uh the Marshall decides in 1992 to release um, uh, a batch of pedals that are loosely based to emulate. They, they're going to name them based on amps that they think will sell pedals, I think, um, that are yeah. supposed to emulate these pedals. And um, uh, the governor, the what's the other one? The Shredmaster, right? And then the Shredmaster, the governor, the Bluesbreaker, yeah. Bluesbreaker, right? Um, and, uh, and then that kind of muddies the water because the first, the amp became named that. It's not like Marshall named it that. It became associated with the record and then everybody referred to that layout as a, um, as a Bluesbreaker style amp, as an amp. Uh, and yeah. then it was equated with that sound. And when we were talking yesterday, when we got started on this, um, we were saying how people buy these and run a, run a Les Paul into the front of them and turn them way up and you know they're chasing this Clapton tone. One of the things we spent a lot of time on on the original video was that um, if you're trying to get that in a room with just an amp and a guitar, you're missing. You in particular were really good about pointing out to everybody, reminding everybody how much compression was happening for all, all the tube-based equipment at DECA. And and the effects that they had available. I mean, I, I think a lot of credit is given to the open mics and things like that that were in the room, but they had, you know, some fairly recent and fancy technology echo chambers and EMT plates. And they were using them. I mean, I think most of the ambience that I hear on that record sounds artificial. It's not, I'm not in a bad way, but it sounds like it's not a big room. And they weren't in the big room. They were a, they were a loud blues band. They stuck them in Studio B, not Studio A. So they're not in the orchestra room over at DECA recording studios. Right. They're in Studio B. They're in, you can see it's small. It's close quarters. So to be able to develop that much ambience in a room that's probably not a lot bigger than what some of us might have in our house, I think that's given too much credit to it when you hear the amount of ambience that's on there. So that's there. And all of that equipment, um, because of the way it blends with the dry guitar sound itself, you know, is going to color it even more. It's it's tough to, to pull all those layers away and know that you're hearing the sum that appeared at Eric Clapton's speaker that day. Whereas, you know, more modern uh, recording techniques, um, and the ability to listen to stems and thing on, things like that online where maybe effects haven't been applied yet. You know, so if a guitar, if a guitar player on a famous recording has uh, their amp in an ISO booth, so there's no ambience coming from the room and there's no effects applied yet, you tend to be able to hear what actually came out of the speaker that day. Whereas in the, ter in the case of Eric's amp, uh, we can't hear that. Right. We can't. We can't roll that back and have that because there no such thing as stems. Um, 66... This is, it shows my ignorance here. I wonder uh, if it was an eight track room. It was probably an eight track tape or four. Uh, I think it was eight. No, I think it was four. I no, think it's it four. was. I think it's four. I think it has it was. to be four because um, uh, Sergeant Peppers is a four track recording. Right. And I and think it's a year or two later. And they're the Beatles. <laughs> so I'm pretty, <laughs> over so I'm over pretty at EMI. Sure. Right. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure uh, that would be a four track recording. Yeah. Uh, I want to thank folks uh, that question. I had to think. the top chat. Very nice. Um, son of a wheelchair pillow. Oh, sort of a PG rated uh, a naming convention there. It says I should come by 
uh, Colorado. Thanks for the invitation. And, and Lyle, thank you for that. He says that David is speaking truth. We knew this. David, thank you for your endorsement. <laughs> That's thank right. You, Lyle. <laughs> <It's a lot. laughs> so, um, yeah, ra ra everybody's agreeing that it was probably four tracks. Uh, so, uh, Bebe, he just says it was four tracks. Thanks, Bebe. Like I said, that's why we have the baby here. All right. So then in 1992, as I said, they are, they wanted to come out with something. So they came out with this. And this is right. the original, this is the original black box blues breaker pedal. Um, and this, um, as it was an English made pedal, it's not to be confused with this. These weren't very popular. They didn't stay in the market very long. And then they brought out these. And as Josh is quick to remind us on his video, this is not this. This is not this is not this. There, did you get that? Okay, so um, and and it doesn't sound like the combo either. I mean, that pedal plugged into uh, most guitar amps produces a little bit of a smaller, you know, sound, which pedals from that era tended to do. Um, and I think. Uh, it also depends on how you were setting the amps at, at the time in 1992. And remember, this is Kurt Cobain has taken over here and, you know, Marshall and their infinite wisdom has brought out the sound of Eric Clapton in 1966, a guitar God. And we have the anti guitar God in charge of everything. And that's when they bring out this pedal. Yeah, so oops. the context of the era, they didn't is, see it coming. A lot. Now it, it worked well as, as a boost, um, but it's got some limitations as a boost. So like um, if, if you compare them at unity gain directly next to something like a tube screamer, uh, a tube screamer sounds very much like you're holding your nose. It's like very boxy sounding in comparison to the blues breaker. The blues breaker has got a much more balanced sound. Uh, it's more natural sounding. You can play humbuckers through it and it doesn't have too much of that kind of um, I can hear the clean sound and the distorted sound kind of separated, but trying to come together. But the blues breaker had the uh, unfortunate downside of it didn't have a lot of output. Hmm. So where you could use your tube screamer with the drive control set low and the volume control set very high to drive your amp that was already on the edge of breakup or possibly beyond the edge of breakup. The blues breaker wasn't great for that. It would give you some additional harmonics and sustain to add to it, but it did, really didn't push the front of the amp further. So there was some shortcomings of it that some of the uh, boutique guys along the way have, uh, I will use the term corrected, but it's their envision, their way of envisioning it. I don't think Marshall at the time had thought about that, but it's a little small sounding to be the entire sound. And um, when I say that, we think of amps now almost as playback systems. Clubs have gotten smaller. Clubs back then were bigger. Uh, a lot of the sound came off the stage because, and so the amp could be louder and produce more. Today we wear in-air monitors there's, sometimes there isn't any kind of a monitor on stage and they're, all of the sound is front of house. And a lot of sound men, even in small rooms, want control of the sound to the extent that everything is coming back front of house as though they're mixing a recording session live in a sense, whereas the instruments aren't affecting the mix out front because they're so loud. So guitar amps now are tend, to, tend to be played at a level where they're not distorting. And, and I guess that's a good thing, but that required that pedals, if we were going to go the route of pedals, and we did, um, are going to uh, produce the entire balanced sound. They can't afford to be boxy sounding like here's a, uh, a clone of, of a, uh, a blues breaker. Uh, that's the Mora one, the, the blues crab. And basically, it's the same kind of thing. If you want to spend like 40 bucks or so on Amazon, buying a, you know, an inexpensive version of what, what these blues breaker pedals sound like, something like that. It works. It's a pretty easy circuit. Uh, I mean, as all these analog pedals are, I mean, uh, you mentioned the term genius earlier, and it's not a good term for pedal builders because if we were geniuses, we would not build pedals. That's kind of the rule. You know, I mean, a genius, genius wouldn't genius, choose that career path? A genius realizes this <laughs> low bar of entry profession is not where genius needs to go. We can be engineers, we can be smart, but we can be guys who are smart enough to engineer or clone or modify, but also smart enough to know we're not going to be the genius and we're, we should be happy to do these okay. things in our garage and have an audience for it. Okay. So, I mean, for, I for reference, the average analog guitar pedal is not more sophisticated 
than the AM radio that granddad used to keep in his pocket when he went to the ball stadium with the little one piece uh, earpiece in. Those are more complicated than most of the pedals that we make. Hmm. Now, slaving over tuning uh, and filtering and diving into minutia, that's a different topic. Um, a lot of that has, has to do with um, what pedal builders do. So I'll, I'll, let me do this real quick here, even though you might have a question to ask me later. Uh, what we're trying to interpret with this and what along the way Ibanez and Marshall and Boss and then guys like me in our garage are trying to do is essentially similar to what Segovia had to do, but not on that level. Um, when he looked at music of great composers that had been played by orchestras and then made it work, he transposed and transcribed to the guitar. And mm -hmm. so we're transposing and transcribing from amplifier and speaker and volume into a pedal in a sense. And so there's a lot of this kind of empirical knowledge that goes with this. You have to hear loud amps. You have to experience it. You have to play loud and live. You have to know what an amp's going to do when it's being played at a more dynamic level so that it's clean. And how you tailor the overdrive pedal in this uh, instance to work well with the circuits that are already there. Are you going to ask me later, um, how do different pedal makers uh, put an amp into a box? Yes. Or should I do? Yeah. Okay. So I'll save that. I'm going to save now. that. Yeah. We're going to save that because we're going to come, we're, we're going to spend majority of the second half on that. Um, so uh, let's do the, let's just do the definition of terms, the timeline, so people can understand how this term gets kicked around. And then we, we actually, I think, I think I said, we'll spend the majority of time. Um, the next step was um, this, the Analog Man King of Tone. This is 2003. So talk about, you know, people will say this is based on a blues breaker, but it's not a blues breaker. Um, and, and we're talking pedal. It's not emulating an amp. It's not an amp emulation pedal. So how is this different? So the way I think in my opinion, that's different is that uh, Analog Man came up with um, this version and they made some changes to it. And I think what Mike was really looking for was to make that circuit that was used in a blues breaker do more of what guitar players needed at, at that time. And probably they needed it sooner. And, you know, he realized the market was there and did it when he, when he could in 2003. Mm -hmm. And so that's to try to uh, make the response of it a little bit more broad, a little bit less mid-focused, uh, and have a little bit more uh, control. And so uh, a pedal like that starts to meet that you know demand or does a great job of meeting that demand. He is inundated at all times with orders for those. So, mm -hmm. so. Uh, right. And, and probably will be throughout for as long as he feels like it. Mm -hmm. So that's a great thing. Yeah, that is a nice thing. And he's a genius. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope he's watching. Uh, yeah, so well, that was 2003. And uh, other examples of pedals that are based on that Blues Breaker black pedal, the original black pedal, would be the GHS Morning Glory, um, the Wampler Pantheon. Um, the and so with, with, Sorry, with the Morning ahead. Glory, I think jo uh, Josh has talked about that he put a fairly simple uh, transistor amplifier at the end. I think he may have likened it to like an LPB one like the linear power booster type of thing and so he took a blues breaker and gave it the output to allow it to drive amplifiers that marshall didn't originally give it and okay. so that, i think that's kind of his angle on it and then a snouse black box is supposed to be a straight up cologne according to the people at snouse and then uh, keely did in 1962. those are all versions of right. that original black box circuit reimagined through each of the builders they're not clones. I mean, the Snaus guy is pretty clear that he's actually building component to component copies of the original black one. They weren't available when he started doing it. I actually don't know if he's doing them now anymore that Marshall has reissued the pedal. Um, uh, but the Snaus is, is one that you always hear about. Um, well, one of the reasons why you would buy something like that, an, an exact clone, but made by uh, a boutique builder or a hand builder, is they're probably going to select parts that are a little bit more attainable on the road. So road durability is an important thing. So there's a difference between cost of acquisition and cost of ownership and what it feels like to own something. So something like I showed earlier, this more blues crab pedal, I would not play this on stage personally, not because it sounds bad, because um, I don't know whether 
it would stand up to that in a way that I could absolutely rely on it not to fail. And if it did fail, how easily could I get the parts? Um, it could probably be changed so it worked that way, but I would assume the people at SNAUS are making something that's very serviceable by the average technician that would work on the road. That's an important thing because the average technician that's on the road isn't necessarily versed in everything. They're not polymaths. They tend to be better at one part of the guitar rig than they are the entire thing. So uh, serviceability is an important thing. It all goes into longevity, serviceability, overall build, quality of parts. These are the reasons why you might not buy uh, the Marshall or why you might not go gigging with a $40 pedal. And then again, you might hang loose and just do it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, we're at, we're at the half May mark, so I got to do my, uh, Patreon ad. So let me do that and I'll bring you right back. Okay. I promise. Uh, as you guys know, um, Patreon's letting me build a more close knit sub community from within the five watt world, the greater five watt world. All thanks to all of you. We broke 250,000 subscribers. Uh, so my ego metrics are intact <laughs> as the saying goes. Um, you know, because Five Watt World was founded, the the Patreon folks was founded like Five Watt World was founded by a musician first who really wanted to have community building tools important, and that that was their top priority at Patreon. I think that makes a huge difference to the way it works, uh, even to the point where I'm not sure it's always that profitable for Patreon itself. He's very interested in trying to have tools for making that happen, and he's always pushing that envelope. They're not always successful from my end, I can tell you, um, except for the level of communication that it makes possible. And that, frankly, that's the only reason I'm still on Instagram is it's easy for people to DM me from there directly um, that they might come across me there. I don't actually don't think it's Instagram. Well, don't get me going about Instagram. Um, uh, I also like that it's not being controlled by YouTube, uh, that, uh, you know, I could do a, a membership system through YouTube and they would take their big bite. I think it's 40% that they take when they do it. Um, Patreon takes a piece, but it's not that big. Um, and, uh, YouTube's giving me this platform. Of course, I love, you know, to be here and doing this the way we do it. Um, but at the same time, it's good to have, um, different ways to communicate, to connect with people. Um, yeah, I like, I like that Patreon lets me step aside from that stuff. Uh, there's three different paid levels of support, five, 10 and $15 a month. Um, at $5 a month, you'd or invited any live streams that I do that are just for the community. I haven't done that many of those because when I do them, they don't seem to be at a good time or for people. I don't get many people logging in. Um, if people let me know that that was something you're interested in, I'd do more. I would do these you know, for just that community. At $10 a month, you get to see all the videos before they come out. And at $50 a month, you also would get to do a, a monthly conversation with me if that's something you're into. Um, and that could be about your YouTube channel. That could be about um, your amp rig. It could be anything that I can help with. I'm glad to. And honestly, um, I really enjoy the direct contact of it. It makes it feel more like a community because as I heard in a definition a couple of years ago, is it two years ago now? Maybe just last year, somebody was really going on about communities are where you can actually have a back and forth conversation. This is an audience. I'm talking to it. And there's a number of you that I've gotten to recognize over time, um, but I wouldn't necessarily know you if I bumped into you at Sam's Club or Costco or wherever you shop. I don't shop at any of those places, but that's just because we don't have them here. Um, in upstate. So if you can afford that, it's the most direct way to support what I do, uh, you know, and uh, once you've topped out on t-shirts and hoodies and hats, um, if you can think about Patreon, I really appreciate it. The links are in the description. And with that, we will get back. We'll get David back. Oh, he's having a, he's having a beverage. Oh. <laughs> I rotated David. back into the scene. Did you have a nice break? I was fantastic. <laughs> I sent you a postcard. You'll get it later. <laughs> so, hey, um, so that's that's the pedal. That's the history of the pedal. But yeah. but then there are pedals that actually are uh, amp emulation pedals. Amp in a box. Amp in a box. So how would you how would you define the mission difference between a a Morning Glory and a JSS Charlie Brown? The same designer picking his poison different ways on different days. Different ways on different days. Yes. Okay. It absolutely. Is. So I don't know what's going on inside. Uh, which one's that? The Charlie Brown? So, yeah, Charlie Brown. Those are both Josh Scott. You know. Charlie Brown. I was slouching. So um, uh, in, in the first instance uh, that you mentioned, the um, uh, Morning Glory 
he's working straight up from an homage to uh, the Marshall uh, Blues Breaker, and he's only changing what he feels like makes it more useful to him, and he believes that it would become more useful at that point to his buying audience, to other guitar players out there. It's not a bad bet. You know, mm -hmm. the, the, the Blues Breaker, you know, uh, circuit became more exciting to people, especially as um, we kind of wore out everything you could do with the Tube Screamer between all the, you know, pedal builders and things. So it was nice to have different circuits that people could take a shot at. But with something like the Charlie Brown, I assume what he's doing there is uh, he could be doing. So let's talk about one approach that people use. They basically scale a tube amp. So you'll take a tube amp like a um, blues breaker. We'll go with that. Let's and, use a 1962 instead, Marshall. There you go. I don't know why I picked that, but I did. Um, and so instead of tubes, you'll replace the tubes with JFATs because there's a feeling that JFATs sound very similar to tubes that some people tell, feel. Tell now, people what a JFAT is. It's a field effect transistor. It's a transistor. It's a transistor. Thank you. Um, so uh, some people feel that it sounds like a tube. I tend to feel like it sounds like a tube a little bit and more than most transistors do when it's played clean or on the edge of almost breaking up. I think once it breaks up, while you can look at a scope and see that it's doing things and producing harmonics that might be similar to a tube, your ear doesn't, to me, my ear doesn't say the same thing. So I've seen a lot of these kind of JFET scalings of uh, amplifiers where you take all the circuits that are in the amp and you just reproduce them with tiny little transistors and tiny little resistors and capacitors and you make the exact same circuit. So where and there would be a tube, there's now a JFET. Exactly. And so you have to scale the resistors and things around that. There are different mm -hmm. impedances to the in input side and output side of the JFET to some degree. Uh, and there's different voltages and things. So you have to account for all of those sort of things. But overall, that's what a lot of these amp in a uh, box guys are. And I, I don't know how popular any one of those pedals has ever become. I'm sure there's got to be at least one out, out there that, that uh, has a big following. But I've seen them come and go. But it seems like the op amp versions of overdrives tend to always do better. Mm -hmm. And they tend to be referred to as more uh, amp, amp like Um there's some and there's some issues with reproducing an amplifier in an amp in a box format where you're just scaling it down into transistors. One of those is the reproduction amp that you're going to use. So a lot of people are using a, like a, um, a Fender Blackface style reproduction. They've got a, a deluxe reverb reissue. They've got a twin. They've got a super. They've got a modeler that does the deluxe. Whatever it is, it's got a Fender print to it, a sound quality, a sound print. So so when like you're that. you're designing a pedal to sound like a different amp. The assumption is you're going into something Fender-ish. And that is it. We are all, most of us are working off assumption that we have to land it somewhere in between the Fender clean sound and what little there is, Marshall clean sound, maybe Vox too. Um, and that's why in some areas, because the big difference between all those three of those different things, and don't forget there's Fender tweed clean, clean sound and Fender black panel style clean sound. So there's two different types of things there. So the main differences between most of those are really where their mid-range notch kind of happens. There's like a little cut usually in the mid-range somewhere, so it's not perfectly flat, whereas a 5E3 is a sound that is a lot more flat, 5E3 being a tweed deluxe. That's more of an amp that it's almost like a little power amp you plug into. What little bit of EQ we ha it has is very crude, and the more you turn the volume up, uh, the less your tone knob even works anyway. It just mm. kind of becomes almost all flat response until you get to the speaker. And because the speaker doesn't have a tweeter, you lose some highs, thank God, and you lose some lows because it's open back. So um, in the case of making an amp in a box, you have this conundrum of you've got an EQ, a typical guitar tone stack EQ in your black panel amp that you're using for reproduction. Do you put another EQ in the amp in a box pedal that you have because it's going to create kind of a notch on top of a notch. And that then is different than what the original amp sounded like you were trying to get. And so this oh. brings me to how I think, and I think a lot of how other designers work, they have different ways of getting there. So, so I believe we're always. So if I could, yes, you're going to, I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and throw one of your pedals on the screen. Cause I, I'd like to transition to you actually talking about how, how you do that and how you approach that in particular around getting a blues breaker sound in this pedal.
There we go. Okay. This is a version four direct drive. That is. Okay. And you want me to talk about this here right now? I want. I, I like to. I, th I have thought you were on the eve of talking about um, how you <laughs> go about of of conversation do, um, doing that. And so I thought, okay, well, let's bring it back to the specifics okay, here because I'd like to sort of end with how this is similar and different than what we ended up with as a bluesbreaker sound on the left okay. side of the bus. Okay, so for something like the direct drive, what I've chosen to do here, and this, again, this might be how a lot of people work, I believe it is. I think everyone works towards a sum. So there's a final thing. So in the case of Eric Clapton's uh, Beano, the sum was what was presented uh, at the speaker of his combo, but this, and that's the sum he heard, but the sum that we heard is what comes out of our stereo system, our earbuds, whatever you're listening on. And so, um, what I'm trying to do is make the sum that makes you feel the most that that verisimilitude is happening is that, um, 50 cent word, I win. Uh, <laughs> well, you're um, a genius. Is, I know. So, um, <laughs> And the most uh, the way to make that feel happening is to try to make that sum appear at your output that you're listening on. The sum so, of the entire path. So the sum like of what whatever we heard path on the record. I have. And so my path probably can't be the same as we start with Eric Clapton's brain. It moves down to controlling his hand. It takes the plectrum, whatever thickness and material, into those strings, nickel, nickel plated, whatever uh, gauge, into that speaker, into that speaker, into that pickup, who, however he set the controls, I think in a lot of cases he blended to uh, a little bit towards the bridge more, but I think he blended both. Whatever kind of cable, whatever long length of cable that he had, at least we kind of know what the amp was, the uh, the blues breaker amp that we call it now, the combo, mm -hmm. and so forth. Now, I have to do that with different things, and I have to basically listen, and again, this is where we get back to empirical knowledge. I'm not going to have that many lines to add and subtract to arrive at the sum the same way as he did. And we're a little bit abstract here, but it's a little bit of an abstract experience to design an amp like that and put it in a box. And you have to have a little bit of faith that um, that you can hear harmonics or in the case of some designers, see harmonics. A lot of guys think about modeling. They have things turned into images. And this tends to be that they trust their eyes or they trust their eyes and their ears. They like the combo working together. When you say and their so eyes, you're talking about looking at an oscilloscope. They've turned it into something or an, or a frequency analyzer. Okay. There's a lot of different, Fast Fourier, I think, is another thing they use. So there's a lot of different type of, of analyzers that they have available to them to make things visual. Mm -hmm. And so um, that tends to be a higher dollar thing for a lot of people. I've never worked that way. I, I've, I've looked at it. I've seen it. But I tend to be able to, to um, hear a sound and then think through with the different kinds of circuits and filtering and RC um, what they can do, the different types of clipping, uh, that, that exists and how you can shape them. And the more you work with them and the more you experience, um, their shortcomings, my own shortcomings and, you know, what has worked and what hasn't worked in the path past, you tend to be able to, to make your way forward, but there's a lot of experimentation that that's required. It, it, I mean, I'm at a point where I've, I've spent 40 years modifying and designing and building pedals 40 you know and i'm not that old so um so there's all these different approaches so in the, in the direct drive um so that has two clippers two sets of clippers i should say and, and we celebrate <laughs> clipping on five -way. people love clipping that's why i did that <laughs> <laughs> um, wonderful thank you apple so um I have an early set, which does soft clipping. And what that does for me is not what most people do. I'm not trying to create the sound so much there of soft clipping. I'm trying to cut to reduce some of the overall dynamics because the next thing that's going to happen is what we call a hard clipper. So a hard clipper is, is what's in like a RAT or an MXR Distortion Plus or a DS1. It's got a lot of edge to it. You can play Judas Priest with it. You can play all your hard rock stuff, but it's a little too edgy to think of a sound like an early Marshall. The, the rat probably gets the closest to getting a somewhat of a soft sound from it. Mm -hmm. Whereas soft clippers are what's in a tube screamer. And they're too, they're clamped too hard in a tube screamer to really produce an amp like quality. They sound a little artificial there or a lot mm -hmm. artificial depending mm -hmm. on what you're doing. 
if you put more of those clippers, more of these diodes in a string and work towards the point just before the op amp starts to contribute its clipping, because the op amp sounds terrible clipping to me, just sounds right. Yep. So you're trying to get as close to that as you can. And I'm trying to knock off um, the most dynamic edges and make them a little bit rounder before it hits the hard clipper. And then the hard clipper won't sound so hard. But what it does, it gets rid of some of that sound of the clean sound and this distorted sound that are unmarried, like a tube screamer. Mm -hmm. and, and like a clon, it has kind of an unmarried, clean and dirty against each other. It's great for hitting an amp that's already distorting because that distorting amp glues those unmarried components back together again. But if you can't play loud enough, to make that happen, the tube screamer goes out the window, the clon goes out the window, and to some degree, the blues breaker pedal goes out the window. And so ours, our blues breaker that we used in the uh, five watt world bus and the one mm -hmm. that's in the direct drive, they are very much derivatives, the same thing that I'm doing there. Um, uh, we've tried to limit as much of that unmarried sound. That final clipper tends to marry things together. And then the other part of it that, that I use and uh, I think is one of the things that I wanted to use back in 1997 when I realized I was actually going to make pedals uh, as a, more of a gig was I wanted my own topology. I wanted something that other people didn't do. So I used a system and this is done by other people, but to the degree that I do, I think it's different of emphasis and de-emphasis or de-emphasis and then emphasis. So that's kind of a hallmark thing that's used in reproduction of phonographs where uh, a vinyl record, uh, has an exaggerated, the groove does, what actually comes off at the needle, exaggerated highs, greatly cut lows. So like 20 decibels of extra highs, 20 decibels of cut on the lows, and right in the middle at 1K, it's pretty much the natural thing. It's not emphasized or de-emphasized. And then there's a reproduction amp that's called a phono or a rea phono preamp that we all had to have to be able to play our, our magnetic phono uh, um, oh, photograph, yeah. and it just goes whoop, and turns it back around. One case stays the same, but now that preamp has got 20 decibels of added bass and 20 decibels of cut on the uh, treble side of things. And that makes us hear this flat all the way across hmm. from where it originally came off of the cutting lathe. So with the guitar, I realized it could work the exact same way. What distorts well tends to be high and mid-range frequencies. What doesn't distort, distort well is low frequencies. If you've ever played old Fender amplifiers, uh, especially uh, black panel ones and silver ones, if you crank the bass up all the way and cut back the top and crank it up, it's ugly. It's, it verges on fuzz. It's mm -hmm. really brash sounding. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that didn't happen. So that's so the early stages, I'm cutting bass but leaving just enough that it can be recovered because you have to think in terms of multiplication. If right. you completely cut the bass to zero, you can multiply it times a million, a million, and you still got zero. Right, right, and You've right. got to leave something there to bring back. And so that's sort of one of the problems that people sometimes get into with designing overdrives, especially early ones that were made. Sometimes they cut frequencies and they had no way to get them back or no plans to bring them back. And so I'm um, later on the circuit, I'm de-emphasizing the highs and I'm bringing back the lows, but I'm doing it in my way. I've taken that type of, emphasis and de-emphasis thing and then de-emphasis and emphasis and i've changed it uh to work with guitar and changed it to work with guitar knowing that the reproduction system is either going to be a fender style sound from one of the eras that we all know a marshall style sound from one of the eras that we all know and to some degree a vox to some degree you know era mm -hmm. <laughs> Vox, like I'm thinking AC-15 is what I'm trying not to say. Right. Um, it's probably going to be something like that that people use for like a reproduction style amp. Right, right. Uh, I want to do a couple quick questions in here. That's that's great. And I think this actually, this first question um, kind of is right to the hearts of it. Uh, James Richardson says, um, this a question for David. Can you speak to how an amp in a box pedal is different? And basically you answered this a minute ago. Let me see if I can summarize well, I'm, st I'm still laughing at I'm still laughing at the one guy who wrote, I think it's Bobby Steele, barber clipping, barber clipping, a barber's clipper. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yeah, I, I told you to go ahead and put the chat up, but it is distracting. Uh, so the the amp in a box pedal is trying to give you the sound at the end. Um, the blues breaker pedal is more less the total sum of the entire chain, right? It's 
you know, I think the Blues Breaker pedal was just trying to bring some of that kind of a sound. They didn't realize I mean, we're, we're just coming off the end of racks when uh, Marshall brings that pedal out. And at that point, there wasn't a high bar set for pedals, really. What Fender and Boss had done, uh, their most sophistication was in the, the, like delay pedals and reverb pedals and things like that. They were still kind of, you know, making bank on the DS1, the TS9. Uh, rat you know had to, those were still like really popular pedals of the day the heavy metal pedal was out and that was a little bit more of a full range sounding pedal because mm. a lot of guys were using hard clipper pedals and then putting like an mxr or a boss eq after them and i always felt like the heavy metal pedal that boss made uh kind of took that concept and gave you more eq all built into the same pedal so that you could do a little bit more of what people were doing with two pedals at that time but it was a hard sound it was not uh you weren't going to pull Robin Ford off with your heavy metal pedal in a, in a right. really convincing way. Uh, Flying Rat says, wants to know, wasn't the rat modeled off of a fuzz face with low guitar volume into a Marshall, or is that another guitarist fire pit tail? I have not heard that tale. Me either. Um, I, um, I think he's talking about what you were saying where hard clipping can start approaching fuzz. Yeah, well, all of, and all of them are marketing terms. Uh, fuzz and distortion and overdrive are all distortion. They're just right. all way of, of making a distorted, even a compressor is distorting the signal. You think of your original signal as something round, and then you press it into something like that. You've now distorted the image of that original round thing into something squ squished down. It's, I mean, guitar players just like to distort things, and so we know it, and we take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. uh, let's see. Daniel Stevenson says, I've never been able to find out what happened to Clapton's JTM 45. Was it given away? Was it stolen? Well, given the era, everything got stolen or it fell out of the back of the I thought he left it in a gig gone wrong, wrong somewhere over in like Germany or Greece or somewhere right after he left and then came back to the Blues Breakers. Yeah, my memory is a little sketchy because it's been a long time since I did all that research. But my memory was he actually left a half stack in Greece. Oh, and then he got this he, he got this amp when he got back so he was transitioning from mayall oh. into cream um i i've never heard the story um if i think our best chance here is bebe would know so bebe put the answer there he, so i'm gonna i'm gonna guess maybe he just wanted louder things for bigger gigs and well and, and honestly and well, you know uh, clapton came back from greece he had he didn't have any money he didn't and he was looking for a gig so we went back to mayall went into that gig um, even though he didn't stay very long, it could well be that the amp went back to Jim Marshall. Um, and when he tried to get his stack, so, you know, just like keep swapping things around. Um, let's see here. Uh, I had another one. Guppy Bill. It's good to see you there, Bill. Um, Shane Walton says, do you, Shane from Japan, do you use a preamp pedal? Do I? Uh, or or is that I mean, all all pedals are preamps in a preamps in a sense, you know, it, it's especially things that shape tone and distortion and so forth. So, um, yes, but not specifically something called a preamp. Okay. Uh, Bebe says here, what most people miss is originally the King of Tone was a kind of signature pedal he developed with and for Jim Weeder. Yeah, that part of this the story. And and supposedly Jim was complaining about his tube screamer. And this was um, you know, the response to that. That's how we all got gigs. People complained about their tube screamers. Ooh, that's how you got a gig. I think that's how everybody got, got those gigs. I mean <laughs> everybody's really, complaining I mean, about tube screamers. So rats yeah, are I mean, the first the first pedal that I made that I started selling regular. I mean I was making pedals for a long time. But the first time I made the same thing over and over again and, and sold it to many of my friends and guys that were gigging, it was all because they had come to me with a list of things that were going that were just bad about their tube screamer. It sounded boxy. They needed two if they wanted to play Voodoo Child at a reasonable volume because they didn't have enough sustain. Mm -hmm. They were noisy when you did that. Um, the lack of bass, the, the whole bit, you know, and that was the first, first pedal that I made for regular uh, kind of sales was a... Uh, tone pump the earliest version of the tone pump which is totally different than what i made later on mm -hmm. i changed it once i realized there was going to be more people who purchased it than just my friends and right. i thought my god if they find out i'm making a tube screamer i'll get arrested and right. so because you, you didn't know better right i had no idea that that would become a thing for eight thousand million guitar pedal builders i i had no right. idea. i couldn't guess that 
Right. So uh, Bebe but says yeah, no. that uh, is what you said earlier. Clapton says he doesn't clear about what happened to it. I thought you summarized this beautifully earlier. You said before we were live, you said uh, Clapton doesn't really ever. Well, if, even if we kind of bypass the brain cells he left in the 60s, he does. He doesn't really seem to have tracked that. He's always just no. moving on to the next thing. Like what's the, unless next, somebody, thing, the next thing? And unless somebody asks him to, and even then he seems to kind of agree with what they recollect. Um, probably because he's being nice about it. I'm not sure, but um, uh, he's just always moved on. He just really uh, hasn't seemed like he, the guy who spent a lot of time in the past. Yeah. Uh, I got another question here. Clone pedals versus originals. Does it really matter? We touched on this earlier. The fact is that what a lot of people refer to as a straight up clone is not a straight clone. That, that mostly pedal designers are trying to address something that they perceive as a shortcoming of the original pedal. That, or sometimes they do make clones because clones still sell. We're, we're right now very much in a, in a clone market. The demand is there. People sometimes want clones more than they want the originals. It's not uncommon, especially if it has artwork they like or knobs on it that they like. It's just not to be cynical about it, but the, the reasons that they, that they often want something that's not the original it just has to do with aesthetics or just they think the story of the person who makes it is cool or just to have novelty of a different brand. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Great. Um, so, so you said that the direct drive, uh, and I think it's funny. So here's the, here's a copy of the bus. And uh, the thing I want to point out here is there's two switches at the top and the left switch, uh, as you're facing it here, the left switch is where you choose between direct drive and overdrive uh, special tone. I have about four of these images from David and all of them, in all cases, the that switch is switched to the direct drive, to the um, blues breaker tone. And you were saying the other day that the um, the overdrive special is a very specific thing, but how did you put it? You thought that the bread and butter of this pedal was really that side of the switch. Yeah, the, the uh, direct drive or super sport, or as we tuned it, more of the uh, like trying to emulate a, a bit of what a JTM 45 combo uh, would do is, is a sound that you can use all night long on the bandstand. And it works really great with strats and it works really great with tellies and Les Pauls and P90s. Everything just works. So it's got this nomadic quality. They can just walk wherever your pickups lead it and, and plug into different amplifiers. Uh, and the speakers that are that are typical reproduction will work really great for it. Whereas the overdrive special sound is really a great lead sound. Um, and it's so big, which is great for doing lead right. work and playing melodies and things like that, that it might not be the best thing you have to play like tax man. And you need some dominant sevens and a dominant seven sharp five or sharp nine or whatever that sharp nine. Yeah. Um, it, you're going to, you know, need a little bit more chord clarity and, and a Marshall or a, tweed style, you know, breakup lends itself more to that. I mean, even Robin Ford playing uh, through his Dumble usually switches back to his clean sound when he's going to play a lot of those expressive chords. Uh, when he plays, I think like politician, hey, that's Clapton and Ford in one conversation. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he's playing power chords. He's playing the one and the five. It's not like, and that's, that's the way the original song is. And it's huge. It's absolutely huge because he is playing through the distortion sound there. So uh, the overdrive specials distortion channel there. So with the ODS sound, I tend to think of that more as single notes. Um, double stops are fine because it's just two notes. You're not trying to build up harmonics too big. But when you want that kind of all night long, if you've got a Cheryl Crow tune to play, you're probably not going to dial in the ODS right. unless you just kind of want to, you know, own the stage. Well, and I think, I, I think like you're saying, um, even in the context, Robin is usually playing in a, in a trio. Um, just, Usually economics. Well, unless, unless Jeff's there, and then good point. It. Unless it's a it's a bitter end gig uh, invitation uh, invitational, right? Exactly, right. Uh, so there's another question. Go by. Uh, Mr. Owl wants to know if uh, a Noble's ODR is soft or hard clipping. Do you know? I believe that might have a little bit of both in that one. There you go. I believe um, I'm not 100% sure of that. Um, I don't. That's not a schematic I have memorized or anything like that. But, uh, and that's that's one. It's got kind of an odd balance. Um, it's known for having essentially too much bass, and so to that end, Nobles has put out a lot of versions with different amounts of bass and bass switching. And apparently, there was some inconsistency early on to the point where you have to sort through them. I, I've heard Tom Bukovac uh, talk about this where. The one he has or the ones that he have are, are really magic. And I think he's really worked like his sound is really magical every time. 
but he's really worked how he plays uh, around the equipment that he has. He knows his gear. He knows what those plexis sound like. He knows how that uh, Nobles pedals works. He knows how those old Gibson guitars work and the pickups that are in. And he doesn't go around changing to the latest thing every week. Yeah. He knows where he is. And he everything that he performs, he plays into that rig that he knows. And that's the genius of you know Tom Bukovac and any session player who's pulling off what he's pulling off is to be able to make that magic sound come through an iPhone. Well, and he always, in, in the rig rundown he did, he made such a big deal out of the fact that the only pedal on his board he couldn't do without is his um, Boss GE7 equalizer. Yeah. So I think that he's tweaking that tone no matter what the drive pedal is, he's tweaking it with an EQ, um, which sounds like David Gilmore and so many other people are you know using an EQ pedal to, to do their final crafting. Um, so uh, maybe it's reminding us that Robin is in a Zen drive world. That's the truth. It doesn't really, he hasn't toured with the overdrive channel of his amp for a long time. So, and really when he travels overseas, he uses backline. He uses a, his backline request is a super reverb and a DeVille run together. So, and a super reverb, uh, as far as your clean sound, uh, isn't just, isn't that far off of what you get from a Dumbo overdrive special. I mean, it's different, but it's not that far off. Everything that, that he would do into an overdrive special will work great into a, uh, a super reverb and he's not a magic trick guy anyway no there's no processing making him happen he, robin's happening because robin is happening yeah and and when jeff told me that robin is playing with his volume and his tone wide open i was just like what there's so it much also, dynamics in that guy's playing yeah. yeah 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 you can see a lot going on with the right hand right uh i got one more question here uh, I think this is actually more Zen drive territory kind of a question. I'm going to skip that one. Uh, I think a good closer is Dan Stevenson's comment here. Love the five-word world bus pedal. Took it to my guitar lesson by PRS Santana guitar, and it just slayed. Can't wait to see what the two of you come up with next. Well, there you go. That's I, I, I mean, that's like the perfect ending to a stream. <laughs> but uh... <laughs> um, All right. Well, we're, we are out of time. And uh, somebody said it here, uh, where is it? I we should put it up. Somebody said here, Dave is a master at translating techie into terms I can understand. I really like the pedals I have of his. There you go. There you go. That's a nice little warm fuzzy you. for you right at the end. Nice. All right. Well, David, thank you so much for being here. I, I said to David before, and I'm going to try to put it on the schedule more. We're going to try to have David on every couple of months at least. Um, and, uh, and I, if you guys have ideas for topics that you'd like us to do with David and let him, you know, let his, his tech flag fly, uh, then, um, <laughs> then go ahead and send it to me in an email or in a DM on Instagram. Or, um, like I said, you can just send it to, at, uh, five at world at gmail.com and, uh, and we'll collect those up and we'll have, have him back soon. Thank you very much. I'm going to have, uh, Jeff, I'm going to play that little clip and have Jeff play us out. And I'll see you all next week.